Thank you for coming uh, into my room, my channel. We will be reading today Chicken Soup for the Romantic Soul. And there are a compilation of uh, different stories, short stories, if you will. And uh, of course, this is showing a total of uh, 64, 63 written pages. And now we'll begin. There is a quote, is there really a Prince Charming? Real joy comes not from ease of riches or from the praise of men, but from doing something worthwhile by W.T. Greenfell. A lot of girls grow up thinking that Prince Charming roams the skies and the plains, just waiting for that special moment to zoom into their lives, snatching them up and carry them away from a world of shrouded gloom to one of white wedded bliss. When girls flower into womanhood they are always a bit shocked to discover they are Cinderella or Snow White and the man they thought was Prince Charming really turned out to be Prince Claude. Marianne had lived a life like Cinderella, sweeping parking lots for a dollar at age eight, trying to provide for herself and her baby brothers as her mother lived daily tackling a mental illness. When she had just passed her teen years, she met the man she thought that was her Prince Charming. She met him where she was a waitress, and he enthralled her. A musician with a successful band, he seemed to have the widest, most endearing eyes when he spotted her. And why not? She looked as sweet as Cinderella. Blonde brown curls, emerald green eyes, and a face that echoed of innocence and love which was really the look of an awestruck teenager. All Marianne could think was, he loves me, he loves me, he loves me. And this was true at the time. With the speed of a stallion, the man grabbed her up in his arms and carried her off to marriage. Everything was perfect as far as Marianne was concerned. She had a nice home and enjoyed watching her husband play in his band. She felt loved and adored for the first time in her life. Move over, Snow White, here she comes, and she was about to have a baby. She didn't know what other women there were. She didn't know about the other women. The two were also ill-fated in another way. They had not only wedded each other, but they have wedded their recessive genes. When her first son, Lauren, arrived, Marianne knew not something was wrong. He didn't respond to sound, and for a year, Marianne struggled and consulted with doctors who told her nothing was wrong. But finally, a specialist announced that Lauren was deaf and that there was nothing she could do. She sobbed for the first two years of Lauren's life while, he, while her husband kept saying that their son was just fine. Doctors assured them that another child wouldn't suffer such misfortune. But when Lance was born, they soon learned the newborn was deaf too. The walls of their already strange marriage, which stood on a young girl's fairy tale dreams, cracked. But they caved in when Marianne grew angry that her husband didn't want to learn to communicate with his two sons. He left that to her. She learned sign language as quickly as possible. Her husband wasn't interested. When he talked to the boys, he treated them like they were dogs, patting them on the head, barking out a word or two. She took her sons to her husband's parents' house. His parents ignored the kids. She took her sons shopping. Clerks gasped when they heard her sons make grunting sounds. And now she knew about other women. Sometimes her husband didn't bother to even come home. Her friends quit calling her, and Marianne felt a biting loneliness. The stress and the loneliness began to destroy Marianne. She sucked down alcohol like it was water. She fed and clothed her sons, put them to bed, but refused to leave her home. She thought about slashing her wrists. Imagine. When your friends and your own family don't bother to want to learn to communicate with your sons. You don't have to know sign language. Kindness is the language. We all understand that. When you see a child like this, don't act shocked. Don't gasp and walk away. 
The message you send to a child is, my God, you're a freak. Reach out your hand and smile, she explained. Smiles, hugs, and kisses are what saved Marianne's life. Lance and Lauren's eyes were pools of adoration and love, a true love, the type Marianne had never experienced in her life. It became apparent to Marianne that she could squander her own life away with alcohol and panic attacks, but she couldn't waste her son's lives like this. She buckled down and went back to school to earn a high school degree. She got a job with an insurance firm and saved her pennies. The better she felt about herself, the prouder she grew of Lauren and Lance. She started bringing them to visits with her co-workers. They showered them with kindness. It was time for her and her boys to leave their house, cut ties with the father, and move on with their lives. One day, her sons came with her to work, and when she walked into the office of the insurance manager, a man named Eric, she found Lauren sitting on his lap. Eric looked up at her, and the skies began to tumble. He said these simple words. I feel like an idiot. I'd love to talk with your son. Do you know where I could go to learn sign language? Marianne thought she would faint. Not a soul had ever asked her before if they could learn to communicate with her sons. She was shaking inside as she explained to Eric that if he was really interested, she knew where he could learn. It seemed better not to believe him. But he showed quickly he wasn't kidding when he enrolled in the class and began to sign words of hello to her in a few days. When the kids came in, he took them for walks along the pier near the office. Often she went along and watched Eric, who was becoming a master of sign language, talk and laugh with her boys as no one else had before. And each time her son saw Eric, they brightened like the sun and stars in the sky. She had never seen them so happy. Her heart twitched as though it were being strummed. She began to fall in love. She didn't know if Eric felt the same until they left work together one evening and took a stroll out on a pier above the Pacific Ocean. He signed to her that he was in love and wanted to marry. Marianne's heart danced with joy. The couple moved into a small town and opened up a thriving insurance business. They had two more children, Casey and Katie, neither of whom were born deaf, but both learned sign language before the age of five. And at the happiest moments of her life, Marianne would wake up in the middle of the night, her ear burning in pain, and begin to sob. Her behavior was inexplicable because she couldn't think of a time when she felt more love or happy. Edward would run his hands across her hair, hold her chin, and ask her what was wrong. All she could say was, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know. He held her for a long time. Weeks went by and Marianne continued to wake up sobbing. Then, like a lightning bolt, she woke up knowing the answer. She cried to Eric, her knight in shiny armor, that she wasn't doing enough to help deaf children in the world. She was supposed to help them find their place in society. She was supposed to teach the world how to communicate with these children. Eric wrapped his arms around her and said, let's do it. Together they formed Hands Across America. It starts with OU, an organization that encourages the public to learn sign language. And it started making educational videos that use both deaf and hearing children together. So if you ever have a chance to talk with Marianne and ask her if there is any truth to fairy tales like Cinderella or Snow White, she'll probably say she learned a lot about such stories in her lifetime. She's likely to say there's sure a lot of Prince Cods out there, but there sure are some Prince Charmings and there are really a lot of Prince Cinderella's too. This story was by a Diana Chapman. Our next story is Good Night, Sweetheart. Some people believe in love at first sight. I can't say that I do. However, I can say that I believe in a single moment that can teach you more about it than you can ever imagine. I was lucky enough to experience one of those moments on the night of November 23rd, 2001. 
On that night, my husband and I had only been married 17 months. During our brief courtship and the year and a half following our marriage, I had gradually worked towards developing a sense of history and understanding of his family. His father, whom I refer to as Mr. Randolph, was hard to know. This was mostly due to his failing health. He had suffered numerous heart problems and strokes that affected his speech and memory. Every now and then, Mr. Ralph would feel good and begin telling me stories of when he was young. He loved to tell me about when he drove fruit trucks from Durham, North Carolina, all the way to Baltimore, Maryland. I believe he thought it was ironic that he had probably passed by my father, who had worked at Bethlehem Steel during those years. Other stories he'd like to tell revolved around the pride he had for his family, the significance of being born on the Aversboro battleground, and the fine privilege of growing up in Falcon, North Carolina, where God and country were at the center of life. Everything else I knew of him, I learned from his wife and children. My husband's mother, Mrs. Janice, I call her, also took some time to know. She was an excellent listener and was always very supportive and encouraging, but she didn't talk much about herself. Most of her time was spent caring for Mr. Randolph when he was sick and trying to help him relish the good times when he was feeling better. I knew all the heart attacks and strokes had significantly affected his personality. He had been a very vibrant, intelligent, opinionated man, and still could be from time to time. But usually, he was more like a child. That never seemed to matter to my mother-in-law. She still took him most everywhere she went, whether to the church, the beauty parlor, or their daily trip to Bojangles. He enjoyed that so much. When they were home, she sat beside him on the couch, held his hand, and filled in all the missing words he couldn't find. In November, Mr. Ralph's health began to deteriorate very quickly. He had congestive heart failure and was in the hospital for a week. During all that time, my mother-in-law got very little sleep. She never left his side for more than a few minutes at a time. Her presence brought him comfort and freedom from anxiety and she was not willing to deprive him of that, regardless of how tired or uncomfortable she became. When he, became, when he came back home, the doctor said his heart was functioning at about 30%. We all knew that we could lose him at any time. The only thing we knew to do was just to keep living each day and try to get the best from it that we could. On Thanksgiving Day, she decided to keep him home. She felt he needed to be away from all the noise and all the excitement the grandchildren would bring. Halfway into the afternoon, he perked up and said, Where are my people? I want to be with the people that love me. So, she bundled him up and drove him to my brother-in-law's house to be with the, his family for a short visit. The next afternoon, we received a phone call from the hospice nurse. She said she believed Mr. Ralph would soon pass away and urged us to come to the house at once. We quickly jumped in the car and sped the quarter mile from our house to theirs. We found him in his bed with Mrs. Janice to his right and his baby girl at his feet. His tomboy was sitting behind him with her arms around him to hold him up because he did not want to lie down. He stubbornly fought death back for several hours, even though all of his children told him it was okay. And my mother-in-law kept saying she would help him. Eventually, he seemed to regain some kind of strength. His breathing became more relaxed, and he conceded to lie down and let himself be made more comfortable in the bed. At bedtime, Mrs. Janice quickly brushed her teeth and changed into her pajamas while we all stayed in the bedroom to watch over him. Then the moment happened. She came back in, finished her nighttime routine, and crossed the room to her side of the bed. She pulled back the covers and gently slid into place beside him. 
We watched as she turned to look at him through tears, and suddenly we all knew in our hearts that it was the last time she would do this. It was her last chance to say, Good night, sweetheart. It was the last time she would cup his cheek and brush his thin hair off his forehead. It was the last time she would lay beside him and help wash away the hardship of a day with the warmth of her love. This was it. The end was coming. In that moment, I began to understand why the scriptures say, Love is as strong as death, unyielding as the grave. It burns like a blazing fire. Many waters cannot quench it. Rivers cannot wash it away. Love had grown stronger with each passing day, just as death had. There is no escape from death. Likewise, there is no escape from true love. It grows stronger until death separates you from it. And even then, it does not die. Love's strength was made evident in the way my mother-in-law graciously let my father-in-law go. She was able to find comfort and joy in knowing he would be at peace and they would only be separated for a while. She may have let him go, but she will not let him be forgotten. I will not soon forget what love looks like in its finest hours. And this story is by... Cameron Lucas. Our next story's title is Love Me Tender with a quote. The most difficult year of marriage is the one you're in by Franklin P. Jones. It's raining, of course. Why would it do anything else on the worst day of my life? 18-year-old Libby Dalton stared out the window. Her elbows propped on the table, her chin buried in her fists. Stacks of boxes cast sporadic ghostly patterns on the wall as the lightning flickered through the rain, beating incessantly on the window panes. Within the hour, they'd be leaving home and family to live in some godforsaken place called Levittown, New York. Was it only a month ago that Johnny burst into the apartment with his great news? The job offer? The chance to get out of Milford and into something he really wanted. How could she tell him she could not leave her family, her home, her life? Elizabeth Jane Behrens and John Dalton Jr., the blonde, blue-eyed cheerleader and the handsome football player, had been sweethearts all through high school, elected homecoming royalty their senior year and labeled in the yearbook as Milford's high school's cutest couple. It was the 50s, and life was sweet in small-town America. Elvis Presley was king, and his latest hit, Love Me Tender, had just hit the airwaves. At the senior prom, Milford's cutest couple slow danced, lost in each other's arms as the band played their song. Johnny's self voice crooned the lyrics in her ear and Libby's heart melted. Be careful, her mother warned. You know what happens to girls who don't behave themselves. Libby had no intention of being one of those girls talked about in the locker rooms. They would wait, but on graduation night, without a word to anyone, they ran across the state line and stood before a justice of this peace. They could wait no longer. On the arm of her new husband, Libby proudly displayed her wedding ring to dismayed parents who saw their dreams. The football scholarship, the college diploma, the long white dress and veil vanished like bubbles in the air. Are you pregnant? Her mother asked when she got Libby off to one side. No, Libby assured her, hurt at the suggestion. It was fun at first, playing house in the tiny apartment, where they never seemed to get enough of each other. Johnny worked full-time as a mechanic at Buckner's garage and attended Votech at night, training to be an electrician. Libby waited tables at the local diner. The nudeness soon wore off. 
and as they stumbled over each other in the closed confines of two rooms, they dreamed and saved for a house of their own. Now, a year later, Libby was five months pregnant, sick every day, and had to give up her job. High school friends quit calling the couple, who no longer had money for dancing and movies. Frequent arguments replaced words of love, as hope and plans for the future dissolved into the empty frustration of barely getting by. Libby spent her days and lately her nights alone in the tiny apartment, suspecting that Johnny might be fooling around. Nobody works every night. As she returned from another bout of morning sickness, Libby glanced in the mirror at the swollen body and unkempt hair. Who could blame Johnny for looking around? What is there for him here? Baby coming, fat ugly wife and never any money. Her mother fussed about the pale face in circles under her eyes. You must take care of yourself, Libby, her mother told her. Think of your husband, think of the baby. That's all Libby did think about, the baby. That impersonal lump inside, ruining her figure and making her constantly sick. Then came the day Johnny told her about the new job in Levittown. We'll be moving into a company house, he said, his eyes shining. It's small, but it's better than this dump. She nodded and blinked rapidly so he wouldn't see the tears. She couldn't leave Milford. No one would be coming to say goodbye today. It'd been done last night at the farewell party. As Johnny hauled out the last box, she took a final walk through their first home her footsteps echoing on bare wooden floors. The odor of furniture polish and wax still hung in the air. Faint voices filled the rooms as she remembered the night they waxed those floors, giggling and pushing each other, pushing and pausing in the middle, pausing in the middle to love each other. Two cluttered rooms, now cold and empty, Funny how quickly they became impersonal cubes, as though no one had ever lived or loved there. She closed the door behind her for the last time and hurried out to the truck. The weather worsened as they drove along with her mood. It's a big company, Johnny said. Levittown, manufacturing, electronic parts, the chance to get ahead. She nodded briefly, then returned to staring out the window. He finally gave up his attempts at small talk, and they drove on in silence, broken only by the squeaky thumps of windshield wipers. As they reached the outskirts of Levittown, the rain stopped and the sun shone through broken patches in the clouds. It's a good sign, Johnny said, looking up at the sky. She nodded silently. After a few wrong turns, they found their new home and Libby stared solemnly at the tiny box in the middle of identical boxes like Monopoly houses lined up on an Oriental Avenue. Are you ever going to smile again, Lib? She climbed out of the cab and scolded herself. Grow up, Libby. Do you think this is any easier for him? She wanted to say she was sorry, but the ever-ready tears welled up and she turned away. Without a word, they carried boxes into the house, setting them down wherever they could find room. Sit down and rest, Lib, Johnny said. I'll finish unloading. She sat on a box and stared out the window. At least it stopped raining. A knock interrupted her thoughts, and she opened the door to a girl about her own age, obviously pregnant, holding a small plate of cookies. Welcome to the neighborhood, she said. I'm Susan but everybody calls me Suey. They sat on boxes eating cookies and comparing pregnancies, morning sickness and backaches. Suey was due in two months, Libby in four. I can come over tomorrow and help you settle in if you like, Suey said. It's so good to have someone to talk to. Amen, thought Libby. After Suey left, Libby glanced around the room with a new eye. Maybe some blue curtains in the kitchen. The door suddenly sprang open and Johnny ran in, hurriedly digging through the boxes. He pulled out a small radio, plugged it into the wall socket, and suddenly, their song, 
and the voice of Elvis singing drifted into the kitchen. They heard the dish jockey's voice over the music, and this request comes from a pair of newcomers in town. Congratulations to John and Libby Dalton on their wedding anniversary. Johnny had remembered their anniversary. She had forgotten. Tears streamed down her face, and the wall of silence and self-pity she had built around herself crumbled. He pulled her up to him, and she heard his voice singing soft and sweet in her ear. Together they danced in between, packing cartons, clinging to each other as if discovering love for the first time. Sunlight filtered through the window in the new house in the new town, and as she felt the first kicks of the new life inside her, Libby Dalton learned the meaning of love. And that story was written by Jacqueline Lee Lindstrom. Our next story's name is A Wife's Greatest Gift. Nate suffered a devastating blow when he lost his job. His boss had spoken curtly, Your services are no longer needed. Nate left the building, a broken man filled with despair. By the time he reached home, he was in a deep depression. When he entered his house, he blurted out to his wife, Sophia, I lost my job. I am a complete, utter failure. A tense silence followed. Then a smile crept across Sophia's face. What great news, she responded. Now you can write the book you've always wanted to write. But I have no job and no prospect of a job, he objected, completely without hope. If I struggle to be an author, then what will we live on? Where will the money come from? Sophia took her husband by the hand and led him to the kitchen. Opening a drawer, she took out a box that was full of cash. Where on earth did you get this? Nate gasped. To whom does it belong? It's ours, Sophia replied. I always knew that one day you would become a great writer if only you were given the chance. From the money you gave me for housekeeping every week, I have saved as much as I could so you would have your chance. Now there is enough to last us one whole year. What a surprise! What an encouragement! What a wife! Nathaniel Hawthorne did write that year, and the novel he wrote became a literary masterpiece. The book, The Scarlet Letter. And this short story was written by Marilyn Carlson Weber. Our next short story is named The Fortune Cookie Prophecy, with a quote. There is no surprise more magical than the surprise of being loved. It is God's finger on man's shoulder. Charles Morgan I was married three times before I was seven years old. My older brother Gary performed the ceremonies in our basement. Gary was good at entertaining the family and neighborhood kids with his creative ideas. Since I was the youngest boy in our group, I was often on the receiving end of his creativity. What I remember most about those weddings is that all the girls were at least five years older than I was, and they all had beautiful eyes and sparkle when they laughed. Those weddings taught me to imagine what it would be like to find my soulmate one day and to be sure that I would know her by her beautiful eyes. Puberty hit me late. I was still afraid of the opposite sex when I was 15. And yet I prayed every night for the girl I would marry. I asked God to help her do well in school and to be happy and full of energy, wherever and whoever she was. I first kissed a girl when I was 21. From that time forward, I dated many beautiful and talented young ladies, searching for the girl I had prayed for in my youth and still certain that I would know her by her eyes. One day, my phone rang. Don? It was my mother. You know, I told you about the Addisons who moved in next door to us. Well, Claire Addison keeps asking me to invite you over for cards some night. Sorry, Mom. I've got a date that night. How could you? I haven't even told you what night it is. My mother responded with exasperation. It doesn't matter when. I'm sure the Addisons are nice people, but I'm not going to waste an evening socializing with people who don't have any eligible daughters. 
That's how stubborn I was. I was positive that there was no reason for me to go to visit the Addisons. Years passed. I was 26, and my friends were getting nervous about my prospects. They kept lining up blind dates for me. Many of these dates were fiascos, and they were interfering with my social life also. So I made up a few rules about blind dates. My first rule, no dates recommended by my mother. Moms don't understand the sex appeal factor. Second rule, no dates recommended by a female. They're too easy on each other. <laughs> Number three, no dates recommended by a single guy friend. If she's so awesome, how come he hasn't asked her out? And three simple steps, I eliminated 90% of all my blind dates, including one recommended by my old friend Karen. She called one evening to tell me that she had become good friends with a beautiful girl who reminded her of me. She said she knew we would hit it off. Sorry, I said. You ruled out by rule number two. Don, you're crazy, and your silly rules are eliminating the girl you've been waiting for, she said. But you can have it your way. Just take her name and phone number, and when you change your mind, call her. To get Karen to stop bothering me about it, I said I would. The girl's name was Susan Moretti. I never called her. Just a couple of weeks later, I ran into my old buddy Ted in the university cafeteria. Ted, you look like you're walking on air. Can you see stars under my feet, he said, laughing. The fact is, I just got engaged last night. Hey, congratulations. Yeah, at 32, I was beginning to wonder if anyone was going to have me. He pulled his wallet out of his pocket. Here, he said, suddenly serious. Look at this. It was a thin strip of paper from a fortune cookie. You will be married within a year, it said. That's wild. They usually say something that would fit anyone, like you have a magnetic personality. They were really taking a chance with that one. No kidding, he said. And look at me now. A few weeks later, my roommate Charlie and I were eating dinner at a Chinese restaurant. I shared their story about Ted's fortune cookie prediction and his subsequent engagement. Just then, the waiter brought over our post-meal fortune cookies. Charlie laughed at the coincidence as we opened our cookies. Mine said, you have a magnetic personality. He said, you are a close friend. We'll be married within a year. A chill ran up my spine. This was really strange. Something told me to ask Charlie if I could keep his fortune, and he handed it to me with a smile. Not long afterward, my classmate Brian said he wanted to introduce me to a young woman named Susan Moretti. I was sure I'd heard that name before, but couldn't remember how or where. Since Brian was married, and therefore I wouldn't be breaking my rules about being fixed up by single guys, I accepted his offer to meet Susan. Susan and I spoke on the phone and planned a bike ride and a cookout. Then the meeting. <laughs> and as soon as I saw her, my heart started beating hard and wouldn't stop. Her large green eyes did something to me. I couldn't explain it. But somewhere in me, I knew that it was love at first sight. After that wonderful evening, I remembered that this hadn't been the first time someone tried to fix me up with Susan. It all came back to me. Her name had been popping up all over the place for a long time. So the next time I had a chance to talk to Brian alone, I asked him about it. He squirmed and tried to change the subject. What is it, Brian? I asked. You'll have to ask Susan, was all he'd say. So I did. I was going to tell you, she said. I was going to tell you. Come on, Susan, I said. Tell me what? I can't stand the suspense. I've been in love with you for years, she said, since the first time I saw you from the Addison's living room window. Yes, it was me they wanted you to meet, but you wouldn't let anyone introduce us. You wouldn't let the Addison's set us up. You wouldn't take Karen's word for it that we would like each other. I thought I was never going to meet you. 
My heart swelled with blood and I laughed at myself. Karen was right, I said. My rules were crazy. You're not mad, she asked. Are you kidding? I'm impressed. I've got only one rule for blind dating now. She gave me a strange look. What's that? Never again, I said and kissed her. We were married seven months later. Susan and I are convinced that we are true soulmates. When I was 15 and praying for my future wife, she was 14 and praying for her future husband. After we had been married a couple of months, Susan said to me, Do you want to hear something really strange? Sure. I love to hear strange things. Well, about 10 months ago before I'd met you, my friends and I were at this Chinese restaurant and she pulled a slip of paper from a fortune cookie out of her wallet. You will be married within a year. By Don Buner. Our next short story is named Someone to Watch Over Me. The passengers on the bus watched sympathetically as the attractive young woman with the white cane made her way carefully up the step. She paid the driver and, using her hands to fill the location of the seats, walked down the aisle and found the seat. Seat he'd told her was empty. Then she'd settled in, placed her briefcase on her lap, and rested her cane against her leg. It has been a year since Susan, 34, became blind. Due to a medical misdiagnosis, she had been rendered sightless, and she was suddenly thrown into a world of darkness, anger, frustration, and self-pity. Once a fiercely independent woman, Susan now felt condemned by this terrible twist of fate to become a powerless, helpless burden on everyone around her. How could this have happened to me? She would plead, her heart knotted with anger. But no matter how much she cried or ranted or prayed, she knew the painful truth. Her sight was never going to return. A cloud of depression hung over Susan's once optimistic spirit. Just getting through each day was an exercise in frustration and exhaustion. And all she had to cling to was her husband, Mark. Mark was an Air Force officer, and he loved Susan with all of his heart. When she first lost sight, he watched her sink into despair and was determined to help his wife gain the strength and confidence she needed to become independent again. Mark's military background had trained him well to deal with sensitive situations, and yet he knew this was the most difficult battle he would ever face. Finally, Susan felt ready to return to her job, but how would she get there? She used to take a bus, but was now too frightened to get around the city by herself. Mark volunteered to drive her to work each day, even though they worked at the opposite ends of the city. At first, his com this comforted Susan and fulfilled Mark's need to protect his sightless wife, who was so insecure about performing the slightest task. Soon, however, Mark realized that his arrangement wasn't working. It was hectic and costly. Susan is going to have to start taking the bus again, he admitted to himself. But just the thought of mentioning it to her made him cringe. She was still so fragile, so angry. How would she react? Just as Mark predicted, Susan was horrified at the idea of taking the bus again. I'm blind, she responded bitterly. How am I supposed to know where I'm going? I feel like you're abandoning me. Mark's heart broke to hear these words, but he knew what had to be done. He promised Susan that each morning and evening he would ride the bus with her for as long as it took until she got the hang of it. And that is exactly what happened. For two solid weeks, Mark's military uniform and all accompanied Susan to and from work each day. He taught her how to rely on her other senses, specifically her hearing, to determine where she was and how to adapt to her new environment. He helped her befriend the bus drivers who could watch out for her and save her a seat. He made her laugh, even on those not so good days when she would trip exiting the bus or drop her briefcase full of papers on the aisle floor. Each morning they made the journey together. 
and Mark would take a cab back to his office. Although this routine was even more costly and exhausting than the previous one, Mark knew it was only a matter of time before Susan would be able to ride the bus on her own. He believed in her, in the Susan he used to know before she'd lost her sight, who wasn't afraid of any challenge and who would never ever quit. Finally, Susan decided that she was ready to try the trip on her own. Monday morning arrived, and before she left, she threw her arms around Mark, her temporary bus riding companion, her husband, and her best friend. Her eyes filled with tears of gratitude for his loyalty, his patience, and his love. She said goodbye, and for the first time, they went their separate ways. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Each day on her own went perfectly, and Susan had never felt better. She was doing it. She was going to work all by herself. On Friday morning, Susan took the bus to work as usual. As she was paying her fare to exit the bus, the driver said, I sure envy you. Susan wasn't sure if the driver was speaking to her or not. After all, who on earth could envy a blind woman who had struggled just to find the courage to live for the past year? Curious, she asked the driver, Why do you say that you envy me? The driver responded, It must feel so good to be taken care of and protected like you are. Susan had no idea what the driver was talking about and again asked, What do you mean? The driver answered, You know, every morning for the past week a fine-looking gentleman in a military uniform has been standing across the corner watching you when you get off the bus. He makes sure you cross the street safely and he watches until you enter your office building. Then he blows you a kiss, gives you a little salute, and walks away. You are one lucky lady. Tears of happiness pour down Susan's cheeks. For although she couldn't physically see him, she had always felt Mark's present. She was lucky, so lucky, for he had given her a gift more powerful than his sight. A gift she didn't need to see to believe. The gift of love that can bring light where there had been darkness. By Sharon Wajada. Our next story title, Golf Course Romance. My husband Roy had always wanted to play golf. I had heard the horrid golf widow stories and never encouraged the game. After quite a few years of marriage and raising three children, we were informed by our twin sons, Brad and Chad, now young adults, that they were taking up the sport of golf. Needless to say, they wanted their daddy to play with them. They begged and pleaded, but he had lost interest several years earlier. Our son surprised Roy with a set of golf clubs on Father's Day. During our vacation that year, the three of them played a round of golf. Since he had so much fun, Roy wanted to share the experience with me. Let's go to the golf course, he begged one Saturday afternoon. Why on earth would I want to play golf, I asked. You can drive the cart, he replied. Please. I saw a pitiful look on his face, just like a little boy with no money in a candy store. My first thought was, sure I can, but I could also drive my car to the mall. It would be a cooler and a lot more fun. I looked back at his sad face and finally agreed to go. Now how long will this take, I asked with a twinge of resentment in my voice. We will only play nine holes, he said. He whistled as he got his equipment together. We headed for the green grass of the golf course. I moaned as I got out of the car and sat down in the driver's seat of a little white golf cart. This was not my idea of a good time. Before I started up the engine, Roy started trying to teach me the rules of the road. What rules? I shouted as I took off driving full speed. Slow down, he begged. I laughed and kept driving. You can only drive in a designated spot, he sternly informed me. And who is going to stop me, I joked. I was already feeling rebellious. When we reached the tea box at hole number one, he was shaking his head. 
It was clear that he was relieved to get off of the speeding golf cart. He set up for his first swing while I watched, wondering why people think golf is so much fun. It looks mighty boring to me. He hit the ball, but had no idea where it went, and for the next 15 minutes we searched for it. Oh, this is fun, I chided him. We'll just get another ball, he placated me as he opened the pouch of his golf bag and pulled one out. Back we went to the tea box. This could take all afternoon, I grumbled to myself. When Roy hit the ball a second time, we found it down the fairway a little way. After quite a few strokes, the ball went into the hole. I can't remember the last time I saw my husband that happy. What was that big deal? I wondered. The driving game was on. We were off and speeding to the next hole. I was driving the cart and he was walking. He said he needed the exercise, but I knew he was afraid of my driving. He spent a great deal of time hitting the ball and then looking for it while I watched the squirrels and rabbits play. Something entirely unexpected happened by the time we reached the fifth hole. We were laughing harder than we had in many years. Financial stress associated with putting three kids through college was gone. The strain of too much work and too little play was replaced by happy hearts and smiling faces. And to my utter amazement, a golf course romance was born. By the time we got to hole number six, I had fallen in love again. I felt like a young bride accompanying her Prince Charming. Suddenly, he looked so cute trying to keep up with that little white ball. When we got to hole number seven, I sensed that he was watching me more than the ball. Keep your eyes on the ball, I reprimanded him. But I can't, he replied. I like looking at you. At that point, he decided that he would ride with me again. This time, he didn't get upset when I drove too fast. By the time we reached hole number eight, we were holding hands. I don't know if he was holding on for dear life or if he enjoyed holding my hand, but nevertheless, I liked it. It had been a long while since we last held hands. The last hole, number nine, was the best hole of all. Before he stepped off the cart, he leaned over and kissed me. I'm glad you came, he said. I had so much fun. Can we come back next week, I asked. A smile covered his face and mine. Yes, and next time we'll play 18 holes, he asserted. He smacked the ball and it soared off into the woods. We both giggled as we drove off to find yet another lost ball. This time, it didn't matter to me. My husband was happy. I was enjoying his company. Golf was just a good excuse to be together. We were not only finding lost balls, we were finding each other again, too. By Nancy B. Gibbs. And here are 15 ways to love your partner. Number one, love yourself first. Number two, start each day with a hug. Number three, serve breakfast in bed. Number four, say I love you every time you part ways. Number five, compliment freely and often. Number six, appreciate and celebrate your differences. Number seven, Live each day as if it's your last. Number eight, write unexpected love letters. Number nine, plant a seed together and nurture it to maturity. Number 10, go on a date once every week. Number 11, send flowers for no reason. Number 12, accept and love each other's family and friends. Number 13, make little signs that say I love you and post them all over the house. Number 14, stop and smell the roses. Number 15, kiss and unexpectedly. Number 16, seek out beautiful sunsets together. Number 17, apologize sincerely. Number 18, be forgiving. Number 19, remember the day you fell in love and recreate it. Number 20, hold hands. Number 21, say I love you with your eyes. Number 22, let her cry in your arms. Number 23, tell him you understand. Number 24, drink toasts of love and commitment. Number 25, do something arousing. Number 26, let her give you directions when you're lost. Number 27, laugh at his jokes. 
Number 28, appreciate her inner beauty. Number 29, do the others other person's chores for a day. Number 30, encourage wonderful dreams. 31, commit a public display of affection. Number 32, give loving mas massages with no strings attached. Number 33, start a love journal and record your special moments. 34, calm each other's fears. 35, walk barefoot on the beach together. 36, ask her to marry you again. 37, say yes. Number 38, respect each other. Number 39, be your partner's biggest fan. Number 40, give the love your partner wants to receive. Number 41, give the love you want to receive. Number 42, show interest in the other's work. Number 43, work on a project together. Number 44, build a fort with blankets. Number 45, swing as high as you can on a swing set by moonlight. Number 46, have a picnic indoors on a rainy day. Number 47, never go to bed mad. Number 48, put your partners first in your prayers. Number 49, kiss each other goodnight. Number 50, sleep like spoons. And these 50 ways to love your partner was given to us by Mark and Chrissy Donnellan. And that was the end of the book, Chicken Soup for the Romantic Soul. A spoonful of inspiration. And I thank you again for joining me.